Hi everyone, welcome to today's class and today we are going to discuss a poem written by Charlie Tolson titled A Photograph. Before we discuss the poem, let us uh, try to know something about the poet. Charlie Tolson was a British poetess, a teacher, educationist and an editor and also an author of books about walks along the ancient tracks and roads of Britain. She was born on 20th May 1924 in Henley on Thames, England, and died on 15th May 2014. Tolson has worked as a teacher of creative writing for adults, and between 1967 to 1970, she was a uh, features editor of a journal called The Teacher. Between 1970 and 1974, she was the editor of the Child Education. Now let us uh, talk about her publications. Tolson's first collection of poetry entitled Shadows in the Orchard came out in 1960. She went on to edit important works of Charles Dickens, Rudyard Kipling, John Milton and Shakespeare as well. However, her primary interest was in the Celtic Christianity and her most famous works on this subject are the Celtic Alternative published in the year 1987 and the Celtic Year published in the year 1993. Her books are The Drovers Roads of Wales and The Drovers Roads of South Wales are the social histories of the British countryside. This is all about Shirley Tolson. Now, Let's have a discussion about ourselves. Do you often think about your past? Do you believe that the past, present and the future live through us every moment of our life? Really? Now tell me, how do you look upon your past? And what are the imag images popping up in your mind when you think about your past? Are they all pleasant ones or unpleasant ones or a mixture of pleasant and unpleasant? Um, don't you think that we all have a tendency to glorify our past once that time is over? When the present became the past, we say that, oh, my past was so beautiful. Do we add more colors and uh, fragrance to our past always? I think it is human tendency when we have some struggles uh, in our present life, we try to think that the past was a glorious and very easy, interesting, charming, entertaining, etc. Right? <laughs> then, though when the past was your present, it appeared terrible, and when the days faded into the past, they grow uh, in us in iridescent colors, and we will be uh, wound gently by the strings of rainbows and the beautiful butterflies of the moments of the past and they will we feel like they will flutter in rhetoric taking colors in our hearts and minds leaving us in a kind of nostalgic feeling all the time right so and we feel that they have precious memories of the past and they inspire us quite often as a kind of aching joy and nostalgia so, now let, let us think a little deeper about our past. Can we feel how our past was and how these memories are so delicate, so precious and are aching joys to us? We always uh, um, uh, feel very great about our past memories and sometimes we get a lot of energy out of that, right? Or sometimes great learnings out of that as well. So, now we are going to read a few um, chords on the memories. So you just read it well, feel and think about these chords on memories, okay? Some chords are, uh, are now coming to be flickering on the screen. Read them, feel them. At the end of it, you may uh, think that, okay, you your memories are so precious to you. Your memories are you're so personalized and they have wider meanings than what these uh, expressions had 
had uh, tried to tell about the memories. So why can't you create a cult on your memories or your life and its memories, its meaning and significance, how it is important to you? So uh, here you are and you're going to get all those flickering images of a lot of cults on memories. Well, when I too went through the chords and read them and feel about them, suddenly a chord came to my memory. It was written by Mekna Sharma, I believe, and uh, she writes about memories as, uh, hold on. So she says, memories are the treasures that nobody could steal and separations are the wound that nobody could heal. Again, memories are the treasures that nobody could he steal and separations are the wound that nobody could heal. She says further, people say that these separations will be forever, but still I hope we'll meet on the doomsday. Once again, memories are treasures that nobody could steal. Separations are wound that nobody could heal. People say that these separations will, will be forever, but still I hope we'll meet on the doomsday. Mekhana Sharma. All right. So, why we discussed uh, on these memories and our past is, uh, we are going to deal with such a lesson. All right. Now tell me, how do you hold your memories or re uh, represent your memories or you create the, a memory for the future to think about the past? Once again, how do we hold these memories ever in our lives? Because today's life's moments are tomorrow's memories and sometimes we take deliberate effort to make it into a memorial uh, thing in future. We preserve today for our future, okay? Or how do we transfer or share these memories with our dear ones? How can we do that? I mean by dear ones, our friends, family, relatives, etc. You may suddenly say maybe album, photo album, mementos, or photographs, etc. All right, so the same way, here we are going to study such a poem written by Shirley Tolson, a photograph. Okay, before reading the lines of the poem, let me tell you about the basic elements of Shirley Tolson's poems. As a theme, you can see in almost all her poems, there is an underlying or a, a permitting theme which is very remarkable we can say it is the theme of uh, mutability or change, okay? Or the passage of time, human emotions coping with the loss, the ravage of time over the seasons of uh, life always on the go. So how we uh, think about the great laws, okay? Change over time, how time changes everything in our life and makes things into distant memories. So there is an underlying theme of loss, passage of time, how we cope with the uh, losses and how we learn from these memories and go on in our life. Okay, this is the major theme of uh, Shirley Tolson's uh, poems, right? And here in this poem, uh, a photograph we can simply say, as such, like the, any other poem's underlying theme of mutability and change, here as well, the, the poem is the memories of the poet's mother about her cheerful, careful, uh, carefree childhood. The carefree, free, cheerful childhood of the poet's mother 
and the memory of the poet about her beloved mother and a sense of an unbearable loss because her mother is no more. Okay, this is the theme of the poem. Now let us see the setting of the poem. What is the setting of background of the poem? So you can see um, uh, this poem is set base, based on a photograph which was taken in the backdrop of a uh, beach. Okay, so when the poem opens, uh, we can see the poet is looking into a photograph or through a photograph of her mother at her young age, childhood age. A photograph uh, of three children with her mother as the biggest child standing for a photo on a beach on one of their sea holidays okay this is what the background of the photo and this photograph uh, creates in her great memories about her mother and her mother has a lot of memories or uh, mother gets stimulated uh, with the uh, with inspiring memories about the childhood and she may be feeling a sense of loss that she doesn't have that childhood carefree life anymore all right so this poem is dealing with the loss of the poet's mother about her childhood days and the poet's loss of her mother now all right so this is what the poem is all about about all right so now let us proceed on i think you have got a better idea of the poem and the thing is beautiful about is just like the uh, the photograph creates a great memories of loss and happiness about the poet's mother's childhood and also about the loss of the poet's mother at the end when we complete the poem complete reading the poem the poem itself will uh, enter as like a kind of uh, unforgettable frame of a photograph or a photograph unforgettable photograph so this poem itself will create such a great picture image of a uh, photograph ever etched in our mind okay so now let us think about uh, the when the poem was written unfortunately not much is known about the publication of uh, this poem though this poem is considered one of the most famous poems of Shirley Tolson. Okay. So, any loss is a lesson. And any lesson will teach us in our life to go on. So this poem, through the poem, the poet is trying to tell us also about the little losses, the pains, the struggles in life and how these struggles, some painful, sorrowful conditions teach us a lesson and create in us the metal and resilience to go on even though we suffer a lot of loss and struggles, right? It's a motivation for us to go on. That is what the way of life itself. Now, let us discuss a poem now. Before that, let's have a complete reading of the poem. Let's read together, all right? A photograph by Shirley Tolson. The cardboard shows me how it was when the two girl cousins went paddling, each one holding one of my mother's hands, as and she, the big girl, some 12 years or so. All three stood still to smile through their hair at the uncle with the camera. A sweet face, my mother's, that was before I was born, and the sea, which appears to have changed less, washed their terribly transient feet. Some twenty, thirty years later, she would laugh at the snapshot and say, See Betty and Dolly, she would say, and look how they dressed us for the beach. The sea holiday was her past, mine is her laughter. Both ride with the labored ease of loss. Now she has been uh, dead nearly as many years as that girl lived. And of the circumstance, there is nothing to say at all. It's silence, silences. Hope you got a kind of vague views about uh, this. As I told you, memories about the loss of her mother and mother's memories about the loss of her childhood. All right. Now, 
we are getting uh, the photograph presented before us and what is the picture of the photograph and how does the mother look upon the photograph how does the poet look look upon the photograph and what is the present reality okay these are the areas discussed here let's go ahead once again the cardboard shows me how it was when the two girl cousins went paddling each one holding one of my mother's hands and she the big girl some 20 30 years ago sorry one some 12 years ago or so all three stood still to smile through their hair at the uncle with the camera a sweet face my mother's that is before i was born and the sea which appears to have changed less has washed their terribly transient feet that is the reality Time never stops. Some 20, 30 years later, she would laugh at the snapshots and say, See Betty and Dolly, and look how they dressed us for the beach. The sea holiday was her past. Mine is her laughter. Both arrive with the labored ease of loss. And now, she has been dead nearly as many years as that girl lived. And of this circumstance, there is nothing to say at all. It's a silence, silences. All right, this is a poem. Now let's discuss the lines. All right, so we experience, so when the poem opens, we see that the poet's mother is looking at a photograph, or the poetess is presenting a photograph. What is the photograph all about? The photograph it has arrested a scene uh, of the poet's mother when she was so young, girl of 12 years or so. She had gone on a sea holiday with her two, girl co sorry, with her two cousins and uh, the uncle had taken a photograph in the backdrop of the beach or sea. All right, that is a photograph. So looking at the photograph, what feelings and emotions and what type of memories uh, come out and engulf them or suffocate them or inspire them. Okay, that's what the poem is all about. Now let's look at it in a very, very critical manner because we are in class 11. Let us approach a poem with a little deeper implications and meaning and let us think it, reflect on it in a multi multiple directions as well. Okay, the cardboard shows how it was, how what was, how the photograph was taken, when it was taken, how we were at the time, how the poet's mother and her girl cousins were at that time when she was 12 years of age, when the photograph was taken on the beach, they were, they were on the beach on the sea holidays, the uncle had taken a photograph that moment and she is looking into or looking at that photograph. Okay, so now let's look at cardboard of the photograph. You may not down whatever you feel like to understand it better at later time as well. So the cardboard of photograph. Cardboard here stands for, it can be the material of a photo album or the pages of which it seems to be made of a cardboard. Or it can also be a card photograph with cardboard frame. Okay, so... The cardboard shows me how it was. That means the cardboard of the photograph has protected that beautiful scene or uh, the moment of the life of her mother in her childhood pretty well. A cardboard has preserved it pretty well. Or the outer layer of the album where in the page where the uh, poet's mother's photograph is kept has has preserved it so long so well okay so the cardboard shows me how it was when my mother uh, went for paddling on the beach when she was 12 years of age or so and when they took a photograph along with her two girl cousins on the beach all right implication the cardboard is a very inanimate object right a cardboard is very vulnerable to change and decay but the irony is that 
such a decaying object has preserved such a va valid moments of uh, the poet's mother's life okay an inanimate object which is subjected to decay has completely preserved such a life moment of the poet's mother from her cheerful childhood beach holiday uh, fun all right so this is what the ironic element about it all right so the cardboard stands for the outer cover or the frame of the photograph or the that page of the um, photo album where this photograph has been stuck or kept in all right what is the comment on this implication some kind of allusion is it though the cardboard is uh, described as a, simply a cover or a frame it has an implied meaning in the sense that a decaying thing has or an inanimate object has preserved a, a life vitality of a person's life or human beings in, within the framework of the inanimate cardboard but we couldn't preserve our life even an inanimate object could preserve it okay it also gives a kind of striking point that both human beings and this cardboard are subject to decay nothing is permanent right life is permanent but the dimensions of life or objects of life are not permanent okay so we can say the figure of speech in the word cardboard can be allusion allusion is a, a kind of we can't we can't say it is just a figure of speech it's a kind of stylistic form used by the uh, poet okay or an expression which is designed uh, to call something to mind without mentioning it explicitly okay so here the cardboard suggests just frame of the photograph but implicitly it suggests that an inanimate object ironically preserved an animate objects vital moments of life arrested and preserved it right still uh, this animate object could not withstand the ravage of time okay so that is what the implication it is ironic that the poet has ironically used the cardboard as an object of decay helps in keeping the photograph of the 12 year old girl safely intact who herself was having a transient nature of life okay so after that i think you have an got the idea about that so the cardboard shows it how it was how the time was how the condition of the child was the poet's mother's cheerful carefree childhood was okay so when the two girl cousins went paddling along with the poet's mother okay so what is paddling paddling is a walk with the bare feet in shallow water we will literally walk on the beaches uh, in the in shallow water right so <coughs> So the ironically, the vital moments of life arrested uh, is preserved in an inanimate object, and uh, here uh, the girl cousins uh, have gone paddling on the beach with uh, the poet's mother. She was twelve years or or, or or so. When the two girl cousins went paddling, each one holding one of my mother's hands, you can see how vivid is the picture in the photograph, right? That may be emulating a lot of memories, reminiscing, she must be reminiscing over her cheerful past and maybe contrasting with her terrible adult life, okay, the struggles of life, etc. All right, so we may always sigh on thinking over the past, how nice it was and what a terrible thing it is. But when today passes to yesterday, in the tom tomorrows, we will again say the past was very good. Okay, this is what the glorification of past by each human being. This is a way of escaping from our struggles of the present or try to avoid the struggles of the present or try to compromise with or try to get over the enigma of the problems in our life by simply imagining that uh, the past was good it's a way of psychological psychological um, equilibrium of the mind we can say okay so equal equilibrating our mind with such kinds of nice thoughts that the past was beautiful but it was not in at that time okay 
All right, when the two girl cousins went paddling, each one holding one of my mother's hands. This is the visual image of three girls standing in, in the bad, backdrop of the beach. Sea is slashing behind or waving up, ebbing and flowing. And the children holding each other's hands and the poet's mother in the center. She is the tallest girl, the big girl. Okay, the elder one, some 12 years or so. I think you got the idea. The pen picture of the beautiful scene on the beach, the cheerful childhood image of the poet poet's mother okay and we all three stood still still the word is little important to us all three stood still that means her cheerful childhood is arrested in the photograph the memories of her mother okay and we all three stood still the poet's mother and her two girl cousins to smile through the hair at the uncle with the camera they smiled through their hair means what do you mean by that smiled through their hair means they smiled very broadly okay both the sides of the corners of their lips they they uh, smiled very broadly that's one meaning another meaning is they were so playful and playing on the beach that their uh, hair got untied and they scattered on their face as well that also shows the carefree uh, merrymaking, mirth and fun and frolic of the children, the vitality of life, right? The energy, the vitality, the spiritedness, the fun and frolic of the childhood days. And later it is directly contrasted with the deathly silence or the deadly silence. The mother is no more. Just to strike the idea that all the vitalities will perish into silence and death. Mortality transient okay so that is what is uh, struck over here so all three stood still the stillness in the photograph can also be compared to the stillness at the end of a person's life stillness of death that means their vitality their energy their acti activities their pleasure their spirit their vigor everything uh, shadows death all right so death is lurking in every joy sadness is lurking behind every joy okay so uh, spirit is a uh, uh, what i can say is a forerunner of spiritlessness life is a forerunner of death okay happiness is the forerunner of sadness so it's a direct contrast the poet is trying all very colorful active picture of vitality of life energy of life generation of life regeneration of life um, growth of life energy of life in the first stanza to very severely contrast in the second stanza or the third stanza about completely different picture that is about lifelessness death sorrows aches pains unbearable uh, feelings of what i can say nostalgia etc okay this is a kind of technique contrasting images so smile through the hair means they were smiling broadly one meaning second meaning is they they were in such a fun and frolic that they they got their hair untied and it's all spread on their face or scattered on the sides of their ears or face or on the cheeks that it looks like well they smile you can see that the hair at both the sides falling down scattered down like that but it simply means that they were so overjoyed such a great amount of happiness and fun but what the life is now the poetess mother may be comparing with the brutality of life of the present youth with the carefree uh, merry life of the childhood okay the uncle with the camera, maybe, presumably, uncle who joined them for the beach holiday family outing. All right. Then there's a comparison. A sweet face, my mother's. Sweet face, my mother's. My mother's face was so sweet in the photograph when she was 12 years of age or so. But now, that was before I was born. See, the word before is very important to have a direct contrast between the past and the present all right so i was born that is before i was born when my mother was 12 years or so and the sea which appears to have changed less washed their terribly transient feet very beautiful lines though she was so energetic so beautiful so so 
vital in her activities, lot of fun, lot of uh, merry uh, feeling, lot of vitality, but everything has gone in the ravage of time, okay? My mother's, it was before I was born, and the sea, which appears to have changed less, what their terribly transient feet. Now, comparing the past of the poet's mother and the present of the poet's mother, poet's mother is no more. So all her vitality, energy, liveliness have been completely destroyed in the ravage of time, transience. Okay, transient means something which is lasting only for a short time, impermanent. That means mortal, right? We human beings are mortals, right? So, the poet is comparing here about the liveliness of the childhood, carefree childhood past and the uh, transience of human life, okay? All vitalities will contain the seeds of death and silence. All right. So, all smiles are wrought with the pain inside, okay? So, this is the dichotomic polarity of life, okay? The dark and the night. The night cannot exist or night doesn't have any meaning when there is no uh, day or a light. It is vice versa as well. So it's a ma meaning-making process. Life has meaning only when there is death. If there is no concept of death, there is no concept of life at all. All right, this is what it is. Now the comparison, let us stretch the comparison. The poet is using the image of sea here, life. Take sea as uh, life, always rippling, ebbing and flowing, uh, waves up and down. In life also we have ups and downs. So the sea, sea of life, let's take it as a sea of life, okay? So that image is that of a metaphor. Life is compared to sea, okay? And uh, and even we can compare life to time, okay? Life is time. The waves of time, okay? The sea of changes. The sea of life with the uh, tide of time, okay? Has completely swept away the beautiful, carefree childhood and life of the poet's mother. So death the reveler, uh, leveler, time the leveler, death the leveler, okay? So, let's once again go to that stanza. And the sea which appears to have changed less, washed their terribly transient feet. Now you compare the, uh, the changes, degree of changes. The sea which appears to have changed less. That time in the photograph, in the background, it appears the same sea. Now also it appears more or less the same. The sea changed, but what about the poet's mother? She was a very young, merry child, and but she has grown older, and now she is no more. But nothing has happened to the sea. Okay, so the sea here stands for life. Sea here time stands for tide of time, which will level everything. Okay, the ups and downs, and now uh, the sea can also stand for nature okay it can be symbolic of nature to strike the idea of the mortal life of the human beings with the comparative perennialty of the nature okay so nature is comparatively more permanent than human beings the mortal so the poet wants to strike the idea with the image of the sea and the rippling waves and unending wave uh, giving, striking the idea of the undefeatable time, the power of time or unending time of life, how the life uh, traumatizes or life changes, okay, life affects, etc. All right, so we are giving the idea that uh, the sea has appeared at that time in the photograph and today as well, it appears comparatively less changed. But for her mother, it was a sea of changes. The time, the tide of time has ravaged her, ravaged her childhood days, her youth, and she is no more completely, no more. Okay, so the sea of life has completely changed the life of the poet, 
poetess, mother and the poet. Once again, C here stands for the image of life, unending life. C is the image of tired of time, unending tired of time. So when the children were walking on the, in shallow water, uh, and their feet was, uh, sorry, their feet were lashed or swept away by the rippling waves. Okay, what do you mean by that? The passage of time has killed them, swept them off from the earth. All right. So that's the effect of time. Time uh, never uh, keeps anything preserved. All the mortals are subject to death and decay. Now let me bring a chord. Uh, there's a poem, The Brook, uh, which was earlier in your class 9 communicative English textbook. Okay. Um, I think it is Tennyson's poem, I believe. So, the brook, in there there's a very famous quote, Men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Brook is a forest river falling down with all the clatters and sounds and musics and all. And it comes down and it is telling, Men may come and live on the banks of me, they flourish and they die out, but I go on forever. Okay, men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. This also strikes the same idea. Okay, life goes on and people come and go. Just like that. The tide of time, the sea of time and life will devastate lives or dimensions of life, the people. And therefore, we can say that the poet is trying to strike a comparison between the com comparative or relative perenniality, permanence of nature and life over the death or decay or the mortality of the human beings. All right. So let's read the uh, lines once again. My mother that was before I was born and see which appears to have changed less. It appears to have in the photograph and present it almost appears the same. That strikes the idea that the nature is less subject to decay than human life washed their terribly transient feet here is a figure of speech the tide the wave of time has swept away the life of people okay her mother so washed their terribly transient feet terribly means very much extremely transient transient means transient transient this transient Transient means lasting only for a short time. Human life is comparatively very short and impermanent. Transient feet, there is a figure of speech. In fact, there are three figures of speech there. First one is very simple for you, alliteration, terribly transient feet. All right, clear. Second one is transient feet. Feet stands for whom? Human beings, right? So a part of a human body is standing for the whole of that human being. Okay, so the part implies the whole. That's a figure of speech. Okay, so part implies the whole. That figure of speech here is called sinak daki. Sinak daki. Okay, so let us learn a little bit about sinak daki. Sinak daki is a figure of speech in which part is made to represent the whole, or the whole is. Uh, used to represent the part. Okay, so for example, hand stands for a person. Fifty sails, if we say, it stands for fifty ships. Okay, in a, in British English or English expression, suits, S U I T S, suits stand for businessman. So the part of the dress stands for the community of people, right? And boots stands for boots. Stands for whom? Soldiers, British soldiers. Brutes stands for soldiers. So the part implies the whole. So it is called Sinek Ducky. Spelling is, you may not, S Y N E C D O C H E. S Y N O C H E. Sinek Ducky. Sinek Ducky. Okay. So, and this we have seen that a part implies a whole. A part of a thing will apply or represent the whole. Let us see the vice versa situation. A whole thing will uh, refer to a small element. Okay, so whole is uh, used to imply or represent a part. For example, 
if we say about crickets and all the English lost by six wickets if we say the English lost by six six wickets what do you mean by English there it's a whole Englishman okay the British the British what does it really tell here about the British cricket team a small part not all all people of Britain but the team of cricket from Britain that is English cricket team so the all will represent the part okay this is what we call synecdoche so synecdoche is a figure of speech in which a part implies the whole or whole implies the part okay what is synecdoche here transient feet 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 stands for human being human life all right so the figure of speech in transient feet is synecdoche because uh, the part feet, the word feet stands for human beings. Here particularly it refers to the poet's mother. But figuratively it represents human life as a whole. Alright, so this is a second figure of speech. Now let's go to third figure of speech. Transient feet. Transient, transient we know. Transient means lasting only for a short time. What is transient here? Is the feet transient here? Not really. Human life is transient. Okay. So the word transient is used wrongly with the feet. It could have been used with a human life or human beings. Okay. So transient feet. What type of feet? Transient feet. So describing the feet. Transient is a describing word. A describing word is called adjective. Okay. An adjective is also called epithet. E P I T H E T epithet. All right. So the figure of speech here in the term transient feet is transferred epithet. Epithet by epithet word you mean a uh, an adjective or a description of a noun, which is a noun here feet, which is a description here transient. So transient is an adjective. What's our figure of speech? Transferred epithet. So epithet means adjective. Transferred epithet means an adjective which is transferred from the original place and put with a different word, different noun. Okay. Here how is it transferred? The epithet or the adjective or the describ describing word transient has been uh, transferred from, from the original word of human beings to the word feet okay so transferring of the adjective words or epithet and putting them behind a different noun or a wrong word is called transferred epithet so here we have studied three figures of speech first one is terribly transient feet the sound t -t -t repeats okay you know um, repetition right repetition of similar sounding consonant sounds they are called alliterations we say that the t sound in terribly alliterates with the same sound in transient transient i'm sorry transient and the same sound in feet that's the first figure of speech second one we studied synecdoche s y n e c d o c a g synecdoche is a figure of speech in which uh, a part of a thing will imply the whole or the whole implies the part okay here uh, the word feet stands for not simply for human uh, feet but it stands for human life or human beings so it is called synecdoche all right now third one is transferred epithet epithet is an adjective or a describing word Transferred epithet means transferring the describing word or transferring the adjective and putting behind a wrong noun. So here uh, the epithet or the adjective is transient and the wo uh, wrong word is feet actually should be put before human life or human being. So it's a transferred epithet. I think you're very clear about that. You please note down whenever you want to write something. All right. So next one. So figure of speech is over but we sum up what was the thought in those lines Compar comparative perenniality of nature or the sea or the time over the transience of human beings the mortals okay let's go ahead 
Now let's move to the next part of the poem. Some 20, 30 years. So in the first answer, we saw the photograph, description of the scene in the photograph, how the mother and the cousins looked, and after that, ending that with a striking reality from the past childhood to the striking reality of the loss of her mother. So the movement of the poem is from the past childhood, uh, cheerful childhood of the mother, poet's mother, to the present reality of the poet losing her mother. Okay, also striking the philosophy of life changes or time changes everything. Human life is mortal, per, uh, impermanent, transient over the comparative perennialty of nature. Okay, now let us move to the reality. What is the reality? Face of the poet and the poet's mother. Some 20, 30 years later, she would laugh at the snapshot. Time elapsed, a lot of changes came over in life. Her mother is no more a cheerful child and she has grown into her adulthood. She has got married and got children. Now, some 20, 30 years later, she would uh, laugh at the snapshot. That means that now the woman, the poet's mother, is in her 30s or 40s. All right. So she would laugh at the snapshot. Why does she laugh at the snapshot? Because always our past fashions and dress and habits and all will appear to be so nonsense or sometimes laughable thing or sometimes interestingly laughable, okay, or a thing of laughing, a laugh or thing of joy, okay, it'll be mysteriously interesting, it'll be strange, sometimes it'll be bizarre, all right, so she's telling, uh, some 20 30 years later she would laugh at the snapshot what is a snapshot actually snapshot is normally called a very informal photograph okay very informal photograph taken very quickly typically using a kind of handheld camera a small handheld camera that we call snapshot right it's just a glimpse it's a snapshot it doesn't have much of an arrangement and preparation or anything like that so a snapshot is an informal photograph taken quickly uh, typically with a small handheld camera all right so she was laughing at the photograph, seeing the beautiful scene, how the children were dressed up for the beach holiday. See, Barry, or maybe it is the adults uh, planning that they would take some beautiful snaps as a memory of the beach holiday. So see Betty and Dolly, these are the two girl cousins, and she would say, looking at and laughing at laughing, looking at the photograph, she would say, and look how they dressed us, how they means the parents dressed us for the beach, for the beach holiday. Now again she strikes the reality. She presents a beautiful, happy moment and strikes completely different thing. Okay, next, past and present, gain and loss, happy, happiness and sadness. Okay, and uh, what I can say, delight and gloom. All these juxtaposing images are there. All right, that gives a more of a severity or poignancy of the feeling. Now it is no more. All right. This is a technique of contrast which we can see in movies and dramas and all the places, all the artistic endeavors. They will do it to sensationalize it more or to um, become more emotive or to impact it more in the audience. Right. So you will have a very beautiful love scene and after that you will have a catastrophic uh, kind of problem or you will have a very, very elaborate marriage and after that you will have a divorce. Or a child is shorn with full energy and later something happens to the child. This is a kind of dramatic technique of creating uh, emotional upsurges in the minds of the um, audience or the impact of the audience. All right? So... Uh, uh, and Dolly, she said, look how they dressed us for the beach. The sea holiday was her past, mine is her laughter. Now you see, there are two losses talked about here, just opposing the reality and the past, past and the present. The sea holiday was her past. Whenever she looks at the photograph, she would sigh with a kind of sadness. Oh my God, what a carefree life it was. What a lovely thing it was. And what a joyful, merry-making, fun and frolic time I had. See my life now. Life is burdened with the struggles. 
when we grow older and older or elder and elder life will pose with a lot of struggles and problems we have to overtake and often we get lost into that in the rut of life and the burden of life that we would wish to run back to our childhood carefree life where parents were there everybody were there to take everybody was there to take care there was no worry no apprehensions all right this is a way of life it's a feeling of everybody's life okay so dress as for the beach the sea holiday was her past the sea holiday in the childhood they had in the photograph arrested in the photograph forever the sea holiday the merry feeling was made permanent uh, or eternalized through the photograph she has a loss of her childhood and mine is her laughter i feel the loss of my mother's laughter that indicates that the mother is no more okay this we can say a kind of contrast or just a position okay so one talking about a very beautiful thing the next one is uh, a very negative thing now the next sentence and expressions are really beautiful uh, both ride with the labored ease of loss okay so both of them have the loss the mother lost her childhood now the later uh, present uh, the poetess lost her mother now how they bore, bore the loss that is what is expressed in the next line it's a bit twisted but let's make it very simple both rye with labored ease of loss why they are rye and what do you mean by rye then expression of rye is an expression of uh, happiness uh, ryeness uh, expression of rye rye feeling on our face what do you mean by that let me tell you a person's face or, or, or features are twisted into an expression of a disgust or a disappointment or annoyance or a pain that is called wry okay a wry feeling is when you have a wry feeling your face will get into a kind of twisted feature okay and it will give an expression of disgust a disappointment an annoyance or a pain or irritation okay so here it stands for it was not very very easy for them to bear the loss it was the thinking of the loss brought on their faces such a twisted feeling of irritation annoyance sadness pain etc okay so it was not very easy for them to overtake the loss the feeling of loss it was such a great loss okay so both right both faced a lot of struggle and both emotionally they were completely castrated at the loss of it that they had to labor a lot they had to effort a lot they had to will themselves a lot to come out of the pain and the shock of the loss okay simply it means the loss was so much overtaking overpowering that it was not easy for the poet's mother and the poet to get over the loss at all okay once again both rai both were in twisted pains annoyances and irritations and uh, such a difficulties to ease out their heart and minds and thoughts of the terrible catastrophic devastating loss okay again i know that you didn't get it really well so let me tell you the loss of her uh, the poet so the poet's mother lost her childhood and now undergoing great struggles in life she could not just imagine she could not just bear the terrible face of life so she used to think about her beautiful childhood and she feels that's a terrible loss that she has got it's very a uh, very very difficult to get over and compromise with the reality of struggles all right and the poets for the poet she lost her mother it is unbearable she can't beat the low feeling of loss and god in her life so both were suffering intense feeling of loss and pain that it was not at all easy for them to get over compromise with the reality and get over the loss it was so much subduing it was so much overtaking it was so much overpowering them it was so much weakening them and it was so difficult for them to bear the loss okay so they had to labor a lot effort themselves a lot to ease the 
deep loss from their hearts and minds and to go on in their life. Got it? Simply it means the loss was so terrible that it took a lot of effort for them to compromise with the reality of the loss and get on in their life. Okay, so figure of speech. Is there any figure of speech? Labored ease. Labor and ease are contrasting. All right, just like sweet villain. Villain cannot be sweet. Familiar stranger. Can a stranger be familiar? Familiar stranger. So opposite ideas are uh, brought together to give a third meaning. Familiar is different. Stranger is different. So familiar stranger means I know the person, but I don't know the person exactly. All right. Okay. So carefully careless. Careful means very careful. Careless means careless. When you say carefully careless, deliberately careless, it has got a third meaning. So two opposite ideas are clubbed together to give a very different meaning. Okay. That is called oxymoron. You must have heard about it. Oxymoron. Figure of speech is oxymoron. Uh, you may not know. O-X-Y-M-O-R-O-N. O X Y M O R O N oxymoron. All right. So here, what is the oxymoronic words here? Labored ease of loss. Labored ease. Labor and ease just opposed or opposite ideas so together. So we can say oxymoron. Okay. So this is a figure of speech here. Now let's go further. Hope you could get uh, the poem up to that. Uh, line well now let's go now the present reality of the poetess now she has been dead nearly as many years as the girl lived now she has been dead my mother has been dead as many years nearly as many years as that girl lived which girl the big girl in the photograph when was the photograph taken when the girl was 12 years of old and when did the uh, uh, poet's mother die? Now she has been dead nearly as many years as that girl lived. How long did that little girl live in the photograph? 12 years. After that she is not. Okay. So, uh, so 12 years, it, 12 years passed after my mother's death. Okay, and now it is. she has been dead. My mother has been dead nearly as many years as that girl lived. A beautiful expression, okay, interconnecting to the first stanza. So 12 years passed after my mother's death, but of the circumstance, there is nothing to say at all. But when I, when I think about the circumstance of the mother's death, there is nothing to say at all. I'm not able to say anything. I turn speechless. I, I turn spellbound, I turn horror-stricken, I turn overwhelmed, I am thrown into deeper silences. The silence of my mother's death throws me into deeper silences about it. Okay, so it's a silence, a silences. Let's learn it a little more. There is not, when I, of the circumstance, circumstance means about the death, death of the mother, um, there is nothing to say at all. I am not able to tell anything. What is the feeling of uh, the poet? Overwhelming, overtaken by the emotions, overtaken by the laws, not able to compromise with the reality. All right, so there is nothing to say at all. It's a silence, a silence. It's a silence. What silence? Silence of what? The silence of the circumstance. What is the circumstance here? Death. So the silence of Death silences me. The silence of death throws me into deeper silences that I am not able to tell anything about my mother's death or anything about my mother. I can't just think about that moment in my life. Okay? Once again, the circumstance here refers to the death of the poet's mother. Clear? The photograph of her dead mother makes the poet nostalgic and brings sad feelings uh, from the past. But the poet has nothing to say at all about the circumstance because death is inevitable and you can't understand what death is. It is quite mysterious. All right. Silence make, makes deeper silences and makes things very 
mysterious and the poet is overtaken by emotions about the death of her mother that she turns speechless it silences her deeply okay so it is always better to be silent than thinking about that position because it traumatizes me even today all right so she silently resigns herself to her fate and she con continues with her life compromising with the reality of the loss of life okay so she uh, cocoons herself or withdraws herself into silence or retires herself into deeper silence or resigns herself into silence and compromise with the reality of the loss of her mother in her life. Life has to go on. What, whatever make a man go, but life will go on. All right. So now the figure of speech. It's a silence, a silence. It stands for death here or silence here. So silence is called it an animate object silence is inanimate or abstract idea right an abstract idea or an inanimate object is given the quality of a human being or a person is called personification personizing an object or a thing or an idea all right so beauty or death where are you we are calling death where are you okay so personalizing personal pronouns okay so it it is silence is personified as a human being or an animate object okay so silence has the power to stop a human being stops a person stops but here silence stops her uh, uh, into deeper silences okay the silence stops her from speaking about her mother's death all right so rhetorical device here used is uh, Personification because personification is a figure of speech in which personal or human qualities are given for inanimate object or ideas or animals. Okay, so silence stops her from speaking about her mother's death. So it's a silence, silence. This is the figure of speech is personification. Okay, now. I think you have got complete idea about it. Let me now tell you something more. You can see that if you take the poem completely, you can see there is a there is a technique used here, contrast. Okay? And contrast is a kind of technique which is connecting or comparing a planned action and an unplanned action. Okay? What is a planned action in the story? They're going on a beach holiday, they have a kind of lot of enjoyment there, paddling in water, they are taken photograph. These were all planned activities, right? What happened later in the life? They could not keep their life at a, at, at a point and we can't control our life. All the future things happened are all unplanned activities. All right. Uh, the mother grows into, she marries, she has got child and she feels uh, struggled with the burden of life. She feels worries about the past. These are all unplanned activities. She is dead and gone, unplanned, uncertain. So certainties are contrasted with uncertainties. Okay. So in that way, the whole poem is a uh, contrast. So technically or stylistically, it has been written in the form of a contrast of the reality of the past, of the present and the future which it turns out to be the remote present okay or later present all right so now the whole poem is a contrast but remember death is a leveler that it throws into deeper silences okay so now let us see what type of a meter is used in the poem we can say that this poem is written in a free verse, okay, or a blank verse. We can see it doesn't have a very stipulated or fixed end rhyme pattern. Rhyme scheme is not very uniform, so it is a blank verse. Oh, sorry, or we can say it as a free verse, okay. Then what is the mood of the poem? You know, it has happiness, but mainly it is all about memories. It's all about nostalgia, all right. So the basic mood of the poem is nostalgia okay so it is completely we can say that the predominant mood is that of nostalgia 
and that only because of that it connects to every one of us. Nostalgia is of course something that all readers can connect to. You and I. Alright, so it is for certain that all the readers, everybody has moments at which they can or she or he can just get lost in memories of the past. Alright. These moments especially occur when we are experiencing some anxiety, some problems in our future or when we have lost our loved ones. Okay, therefore it is easy to sympathize with the poet's emotions in this poem so that way the poet reaches and connects to each one of them. It's a common theme, common theme of loss, common theme of memory, common theme of different aspects or stages of life, the loss, how we compromise on it, how we get on, etc. Okay, so in that way this poem connects to everybody because the mood of the poem is nostalgia, the underlying theme is that of a loss and human life the compromise and how life rolls on okay compromising with the reality this is all about this poem and I think you got pretty good idea about the poem though it appeared to be pretty long I just didn't want to make it into two separate video and um, get it on like that so I clapped this video in a, all, all the elements of this video into a single one it may be taking a little more time but I just want you to um, go on with it together you may pause it and learn uh, some part of it at one time and you can go with the other part or the next the remaining part of the next time as well okay so you know you you have a short answer questions on these two marks you have to answer in 30 to 40 words or you will have an extract with the three or four questions okay that's the three marks or four marks all right sometimes two marks this is what the question paper pattern about it Okay, I think you understood or you get a, got a clear idea about the poem. In case you have any doubts, you can reach out to me. And there's a similar poem uh, like this by Ted Hughes, British poet. It's all about six young men. The poem's name is The Six Young Men. It's all about six young men who were shot and killed in, in the First World War. And when the poet is looking at the photograph, where the young youthful men with high high end vitality and energy smiling through for a photograph looking at them he understands he realizes the futility of war and how time changes how war destroys everything so the poem is six young men you may read that poem as well so this was all about the poem of photograph by Shirley Tolson shall we wind up here hope you enjoy it though it is a little pretty longer Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Take care.